Hi, and welcome to Genre Chat. I'm Sherry Lynn Bisbono, your host. We have another great author from halfway around the world. I live in Rhode Island. She lives, I'll let you tell her where she lives. I'll let her tell you where she lives. You might, you might guess it by her accent. We're going to talk about her book, her, her fantasy fiction writing. Let's welcome Yvette Wilmis. Welcome. Hi. And tell us a little bit about your writing career, how you started, um, what books you have published. Um, sure. So um, I always wanted to be an author ever since I was very, very little, like basically for as long as I could remember. And I started writing my first book when I was 10. Um, and I got a literary agent for that when I was 18. Um, so it wasn't Kyle Young at that stage. It was a literary agent in Spain and they signed me for a period of two years and then they found me my first publisher. Um, after that, um, Kyle Young signed, um, signed me with Heartline Literary Agency and then from there, um, Burnett Young Books is putting out second editions of my first four fantasy books and the last three in the series as well. And I've been published in an anthology and in a book about writing in general. So, um, yeah. So, I don't know if people have guessed what part of the, of the world you're from. You want to let them know? Sure. Um, so, I was born in Christchurch, New Zealand, um, which is in the South Island. New Zealand's kind of three islands. There's um, Bluff Island and then there's um, South Island and North Island. So, I was born in Christchurch, um, but I've lived in the North Island and I've lived in Australia as well. Um, and I came full circle when I got married this year and moved back to Christchurch. Wonderful. So, do people ever confuse your, um, your accent with England? Uh, yes, actually, my accent is not typical of New Zealand, <laughs> um, so I've, um, which I know is really confusing. I'm actually of Dutch descent. I've lived in Australia, but I've had extensive singing training because um, I'm a classical singing teacher. I do teach pop as well, but I've done lots of classical singing, and that tends to um, refine your accent somewhat, for a want of a better word. Um, so, I won't yes. make you sing your answers, but I would love, I would love <laughs> to hear you sing. Um, so, you tell us about what genre you write in and why you chose that genre. Uh, so, I've mainly written um, in YA fantasy fiction. So, YA is the abbreviation for young adult. Um, so, it's fantasy fiction for people between 12 and 17 years of age. Um, and I kind of don't really feel like I chose the genre. I almost feel like the genre chose me. I grew up um, adoring fairy tales. I liked C.S. Lewis. I was read Pilgrim's Progress as a child, um, and so I loved all of that sort of fantasy, um, allegory type stuff, and um, I started writing my first book when I was 10 years old, and I just wrote what I wanted to read. Um, that book is now published in its second edition. Um, I'm 24 now, so it's, <laughs> it's taken a while. Um, yeah, and so I, I wrote what I enjoyed, and that's kind of why it wound up being young adult fiction as well, because I was a young adult when I wrote them, and fantasy just because I think that way. Wow, 10 years old, I was, I was looking at Barbies and dressing their hair. I didn't even think about <laughs> writing. That's so impressive. So um, what's the greatest lesson you've learned in writing in this genre? Um, hmm. I think one of the biggest things that I've learned is um, that fantasy is not a genre for people who take things literally. It's a genre <laughs> for people who are able to, um, able to see the figurative and the symbolic and able to see um, the big picture and um, meaning behind events in um, life that might otherwise not make sense. So I've had, I'm Christian, I've had Christians say things like my books are occultic. Um, <laughs> they're not, but um, it's often because they take the magic side of things literally. So that's one thing that I've learned. And the other thing that I've learned is that actually it's a fantastic lens for truth as well. Um, Jesus used parables uh, in Job, um, when God speaks to Job, he uses lots and lots of picture imagery to be able to get across concepts that Job might not understand in his human state. And I think that's the strength of fantasy, 
that fantasy is able to do that using larger than life metaphors. That's beautiful because, you know, as you were speaking, I was thinking of C.S. Lewis and, and Narnia and just the overall, if you just took it as is, it'd be like kids talking to a lion, but it's Aslan is just the whole, the whole spiritual picture of his books. Um, it, it's so beautiful. It's just so beautiful. So do you, what other genres have you tried writing in? Um, so, um, I've tried writing some real life fiction. I did a dreadful job of it in my teen years. <laughs> this year I wrote um, a novel, 80,000 words in length, that um, is real life fiction. Um, and it's turned out all right. I'm editing it at the moment and I'm quite happy with it. Um, so, but I felt, I really feel like I honestly couldn't write anything but fantasy really as, um, as a teenager and that's what I did. And I also um, have worked on um, a urban fantasy uh, book for middle grade children. Um, but again, that's in the fantasy genre, it's just a subset. Um, so it's not the same as epic fantasy, but um, it is still in that genre that I'm quite comfortable with. So can you describe urban fantasy a little bit for people like me who are just, I'm, I'm pretty new to the literary world um, and I'm not ashamed to admit that. So I'm learning all these different like sub genres, like under fiction, there's, you know, there's romance and there's fantasy and there's, you know, urban fantasy. What is that? And how is it different from your other fantasies and real life? Fiction yes. books. Yeah. Um, yeah, that was a big learning curve for me when I was applying to literary agencies because some liked urban fantasy and some liked only epic fantasy, so I had to find out the difference as well. Um, urban fantasy uh, relates to its name. It, it takes place in, in cities um, in a contemporary culture often. So in some senses, Harry Potter could almost be classified as urban fantasy because it does take place in the real world in the city of London. Um, however, it has got that epic fantasy feel where you've got a battle for the survival of the world and you've got a, a mass of characters that you have to get your head around. But that's an example of what it looks like. Um, my urban fantasy takes place um, in the States um, and it takes place in a small town there um, in the very ordinary life of a young boy who discovers that monsters are in fact real. So that's an example of urban fantasy. Ah. Epic fantasy typically requires large amounts of world building. So Tolkien is the best example of that. Mm -hmm. um, a battle in which the world is at stake and then a large array of characters um, that are fighting this battle. Yeah, Tolkien has a lot of that. Thank you for, thank you for that insight because I'm still learning all that myself. And if you, if you, were to choose any one that you could have to write the rest of your life, which one would it be? Um, I think, to be honest, urban fantasy. And it's not that I don't love epic fantasy, I adore it. But I feel like I can only do it well once. Um, so I've written a seven book series, which is in the process of getting published. Um, I'm not sure that I could go and then invent yet another world and do epic fantasy again. I feel like once you've done it once, you, you've done it for your life. That, that's like your, um, your magnum opus, so to speak, in that genre. So I, I can't imagine myself doing it again. Urban fantasy, I think, is more sustainable for the course of your life. Um, so that, for practical reasons, I choose that one, I think. What's the hardest part of writing uh, fantasy? Um, mm, I think the complexity of it makes it quite difficult. I think... Um, when you're writing real life fiction, you're obviously more governed by the rules of how this world works. When you're writing fantasy, you have to invent your own rules. Then you have to be consistent. Um, if you're not consistent, you have massive plot holes um, and it's not believable. It, it comes across as a farce. Um, and also, uh, when you're writing epic fantasy, it's hugely complex. You've got so many characters to keep track of and, um, you know, you've got to make sure that you remember what their age is and that you're keeping track of the time so you know what age they're going to be next year and, um, you know, you know whether they've lost a limb or, you know, what battles they've fought in and things like that and who they're related to. Um, that takes up a lot of headspace, which makes me very forgetful about regular items in real life. Do you use a program like Scrivener or another program 
to keep all of your um, information in one area? Um, I'm woefully disorganized, so no, not really. Um, I, I use Microsoft Word, so I'm very old fashioned. I have notebooks, I have a large map on the wall, um, and otherwise I've got the documents of the books. And if I think that something's inconsistent, that I go back and check it in book one um, and make sure that I edit the later books, um, which haven't been published yet, so that it's consistent. So if I've done it wrong, then I really have to um, do some serious flexible antics <laughs> to uh, fix it up in the later books. Mm. Well, that's wonderful. Do you use, do you uh, read any books to help sharpen your tools for writing fiction? And do you recommend any fantasy fiction books for people to, to read? Or um, any of those, you know, subgenres for fiction? Yes, uh, I read a lot of books about writing when I was about 13, when I sort of, I'd been writing sort of manuscript length things for um, a couple of years. Um, I don't really tend to do it now because I, um, I feel like I've picked up enough of the structure of stories to be able to just read stories themselves and um, glean from that. One of the books that I did read though, and I can't remember the name of the author, was Creative Writing for Children. Um, which I read as a child, and I found it brilliant. Um, and it has a picture of a frog with a crown on the front. So um, uh, that was a that was a great book. Um, as far as fantasy goes, I mean, C.S. Lewis and Tolkien really, um, you know, have got first dibs on it. They're incredible. Um, J.K. Rowling is also an epoch in the genre. I have enjoyed Mark Lawrence, but as a Christian, I. Um, you know, I'm obliged by my conscience to say that there are pages that you'll have to skip because it's adult fantasy. Um, yeah. So, um, but the writing is top notch. Uh, mm -hmm. But overall, um, for fantasy, you're really relying on your own invention as well. So you can be inspired by things in other literature, but also just glean the unusual from that um, is going to help you. So I also loved um, the Foresight Saga. That's probably one of my favorites. Um, and it's not remotely fantasy, but it was incredible. That's, that's great information. I, I want to know, do you talk to your characters? Some of my friends say their characters talk to them. Um, yes, actually, it's a um, somewhat embarrassing secret. I have in the past talked a lot to them. Um, my main character of my seven book series was very much like an imaginary friend that grew up alongside me. Um, I was deeply lonely as a child and as a teenager. Um, I've married recently and I've got a dog, so I tend to talk more often to my husband and my dog than I do to my characters. Um, but at the same time, they're still very much here inside of me. And now are you, are any of your personal traits or traits from people you know incorporated in your characters? Uh, yes. I'm teaching creative writing to um, a group of children at one of the schools I'm at um, at the moment. And I, I mentioned to them that all of their characters will mirror them in some way because you can't write something that is entirely beyond your own experience. That's true. Um, so even my villain has traits that I'm, I'm afraid to say do reflect my own personality or <laughs> shall I say he reflects me. Um, but yeah, there are also things that I've seen in real life that I've incorporated into characters as well but I'm less able to make sense of them than I am if it would be one of my own character traits. Hmm. So do you have a work in progress right now that you can talk about a little bit? And is when will it be out or works in progress? Uh, yes, so at the moment, I'm currently um, signed up with a seven book contract with Bernard Young Books. Um, this uh, means that from time to time I have deadlines. I've written all seven of the books, um, but now and then, you know, I'll have an editing deadline or whatever. So those are kind of my works in progress. But between deadlines, which is where I'm at at the moment, I'm working on my um, real life fiction book, which is called The Musical Science Experiment and um, follows the journey of a young Spaniard who's been gifted um, musically beyond the capabilities of Mozart even. He can remember every single piece of music he's ever heard in his life. And um, a scientist um, procures him for human research um, and he manages to escape that situation and then has to find a way back to living normal life afterwards. Oh, so wow. that's That sounds very interesting. 
Well, I hope it will, will be. be publishing that one. What was that? Sorry. Hotline be will hotline be country? I, I shouldn't ask you that, but that, uh, I I don't know. It's just something that I've written. Yeah. Sounds very interesting. I just the fact that you've written seven books and it to me is my first one's coming out. So to to write seven books. To even have one published, you you have to be so proud of yourself and proud of what God's doing in and through you. I mean that that's phenomenal. Yes, that really is. Do you have yeah. a goal? Do you have a goal of how many books you want to publish, or you just keep going until God stops you? Yeah, I think I'll probably keep going till the day I die, whenever that will be. Um, so yeah, I mean I've written more than I've um, than um, I've had published um, but I sort of count the publication as the um, completion uh, which I probably shouldn't because you're a writer even if you've written a book that isn't published as far as I'm concerned that makes yes. you know. yes. um, but I tend to judge myself quite hard so I do like to be able to get a contract for it but yeah I don't know I think to quote JK Rowling I'll probably write until I lose my marbles <laughs> <laughs> well you don't have to you, you can lose a few and still probably write very well <laughs> I could write abstract fantasy or something like yeah. that. <laughs> mm. what, what do you read for fun? Is all, is all you're reading for fun? Is it fantasy? Do you ever read any nonfiction, children's books? What do you like to read for fun? Um, I love all sorts, um, really. At the moment, I'm reading um, Tennyson's poems. I'm in the middle of In Memoriam, which is um, absolutely extraordinary, um, an amazing expression of grief. And I'm also listening through an audio book of Christmas stories by um, Charles Dickens. Oh. Uh, I love Charles Dickens. Um, I do like fantasy, but to be honest, I probably read less fantasy in the past 10 years than I did in the first sort of five years between eight and 13, say. Um, so yeah, but I, I enjoy all genres and I feel like all genres are helpful for whatever you're writing because you glean something different from each one. You don't want to fall prey to the, um, stereotypes and tropes right. that um, your genre is possessed by, um, in other books. It's, it's better to be unique, I think, and that helps by reading a variety. Mm. We have a few minutes left. It went by way, way too fast. It went by way too fast. Um, do you have any parting words of wisdom for people who want to start writing in this genre? Um, yes. I think um, part, part of it's going to be general advice. I think the sooner you begin, the sooner you'll finish. A lot of people want to write a book and they talk about it, but they don't do it. Start writing, even if you feel like you've got nothing and just just keep going because once you get into the um once you get into the swing of it um you'll find that you're producing something quite good um also praying i think is very important i did a lot of praying because it was a long journey and i thought i would never make it um and as with regards to the specific genre um i would definitely take a look at some of those big names so um tolkien uh and um c.s lewis i take a look at some of them um for good ideas as well wonderful now you just had a book that was released can you tell yes. us about that oh, i'd love to hear about your new book it is um it's new and it's old <laughs> it's the one i started when i was 10 years old so it's the second edition of my first book so i've had four books um in this fantasy fiction series the fledgling account published um, but this one, um, we're re-releasing them, so they're coming out as second editions, and so this is the first one. Um, this is the one that I started writing when I was 10 years old, and um, in it, the main character, Rafin, is a slave. Um, he's known by his number, 237, and he's desperate to escape from the coal mine that he works in. He also has a nagging dream of a phoenix feather. Um, both the dream and his name will change his life, because his name links him up to a hero in the prophecies um, in a country called Sayanya. Um, and it means that he's going to be a warrior that threatens everything the villains who have held him in captivity uh, stand for. Wow. What's the name of the book? Rafin. So um, R-A-F-E-N. Oh. The, the, and what are the books that are coming out after that in the series? Um, they're somewhat complicated fantasy names, um, 
So the next one is the Cyanian wolf. Um, <laughs> a man who interviewed me for um, the New Zealand Herald in New Zealand um, was calling it the sea onion wolf for a while. <laughs> and I said, no, it's Cyanian. Um, and then the third one is servant of the king. And the fourth one is the fourth Brunei. And after that, we've got some more regular names, consort to the shadows, sovereign of the West and wielder of the rod. So those are seven. Now, if someone wants to get a hold of you, how would they get a hold of you? Uh, writersanctuary.net is the best way. Um, so there's a blog that I keep up fairly regularly on there. And there's also a contact page as well that you can um, get hold of me through. And I'm pretty good at replying within the, the first day or two that I get the email. And what is that again? Uh, writersanctuary.net. Writersanctuary.net. Yeah, that's right. Oh, wonderful. It, it was so good to have you and thank you so much and congratulations on the second, you know, second go round of your book. It sounds I think it's something that I'd like to read. I don't read a lot, but well, I read a lot of um, books on how to write right now and I read very little, you know, fiction and non, you know, fiction, but this is like something that I would really like to read. So now oh, it's on Amazon, right? Where yeah, can they that's right. Sorry, what was that? Where can they purchase your book? Um, Amazon.com is the best place. Um, the spelling of it is like the spelling of Raven, but with an F. Um, so if you spell Raven with an F instead of a V, um, it should come up. Um, and it, it is a picture of a phoenix feather on the front. Wonderful. Thank you so much for joining us for Genre Chat. And join us next time here. I'm Sherry Lynn Bisbano. We want to thank you for joining us on Genre Chat.